Good afternoon, everyone. We're meeting this afternoon in work session. We're meeting to discuss our annual update to the Educational Facilities Master Plan. I'll note that we do have a quorum present. Um, this session is for information sharing only. There will not be any formal action taken. Um, later, on uh, June 5th, we will take formal action um, on our plan, and it will be then submitted to the Maryland Department of Planning and uh, the Maryland State Department of Education's Public School Construction Program. And that will be after um, our approval, again, on June 5th. I'll note that um, Dr. Michael is on his way back from Annapolis, and he'll come bursting through those doors any minute now, I'm sure. But in the, mean, in the meantime, we have uh, staff with us. Uh, Mr. Prue, our ch Chief Operating Officer. Mark Mills, our Director of Facilities Maintenance and Operation. Mr. Rollins, our Director of Facilities Planning and Development. And Mr. Chris Chriswell, excuse me, our Senior Project Manager and Planning Supervisor. So at this time, I'll turn things over to Mr. Prue. Great. Thank Mr. you, Mrs. Prue. Williams. Uh, and again, I spoke to Dr. Michael a few moments ago. He was at a Teacher of the Year event today and is uh, quickly making his uh, return across Interstate 70, and he will be here shortly. Uh, so with the Educational Facility Master Plan, uh, as you know, this is the framework for uh, how we are going to manage our buildings, how we're going to manage those, those capital assets, our infrastructure. Uh, long term, and this has implica implications into the capital improvement plan, which you'll see in the fall, as well as the comprehensive maintenance plan. Uh, and it is due to the state uh, by July 1, so we usually bring it forward to you in the spring, looking for an approval uh, in June of every year. This year's plan is different. We've been charged by Dr. Michael to bring forward a plan that is different. We've uh, been working through a, a very uh, similar plan over the last number of revisions. We continue to move forward to the County Commissioners for Capital Funding, um, uh, which consistently has been showing us uh, that we are looking at a building renovation or new school opening approximately every four years, one building every four years. And with 46 sites in our inventory, uh, that, that is a, a life cycle of 184 years per building. So we're trying to look at how we can tackle our aging infrastructure a little bit more concisely uh, how we can manage our inventory a little bit better, and how in the long term we can save money for the taxpayers of Washington County, uh, the county government, and the state of Maryland at the same time by thinking about how we manage our buildings in that inventory a little bit more appropriately. Uh, as we move into the first slide, uh, again, we, we evaluate our community through the uh, Educational Facilities Master Plan, what we just call the EFMP. We look at our facilities inventory, the enrollment, uh, into each of those inventories and how the enrollment projections you saw over the last couple of weeks, how that plays into our buildings. We review our board policies. We also update the plan annually. So again, you're looking at something here in May that you'll see again next May. You'll have an opportunity uh, that if you know we, we like a plan, uh, the board endorses a plan, you think this is a, a place we want to move forward, there is a stopgap next year. Uh, that if there's significant public outcry, you can come back next year and say, you know what, we don't want to do this. But it gives an opportunity for the Board of Education to float out a plan of how we're going to move forward uh, with our buildings, but you have an opportunity to change it from year to year. Uh, we also you know, look at how can we be fiscally responsible with how we manage the infrastructure, as I mentioned. Uh, and again, it is the basis for our five-year capital improvement plan that we submit to the state. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn the marker over to Mr. Rollins, who's going to guide you through this plan. Okay, a little background information. Our current infrastructure, we have almost 1,200 acres of land that we care for. But I want to key in on the, on the number of facilities. I know uh, Jeff just said 46. We track 47. That's the Public Service Academy, which is part of Tech High. But it's a separate building. So when we talk about buildings and, and facilities, we talk about uh, 47. There's 46 schools for sure. Um, I want to key on that 47, though. Uh, 24 of those 47 schools were built in the 70s or earlier, 24 of them. Uh, there's 17 schools in that list that are either open or partially open. Uh, five of them are standard variety, really an open school. There's 12 of them that are partially open in some way or another or modified, a middle school that's had some partial walls put up, things like that. Uh, also, when we look around the state, 
um, Carroll County, for instance, which has a similar number of students, maybe a few more, uh, they have 40 facilities. So they have seven less that they maintain and take care of. Frederick County has about double our population. They have 66 schools, so they only have one and a half times the number of facilities we have. Start looking at where those, where those numbers come from. In, the, in our elementary schools, our 26 elementary schools, 13 of them have less than uh, 400 students. They're, they're, three, they're actually 400 or less, uh, half of them. In Frederick County, uh, there's seven. In Carroll County, there's one. So half of our elementary schools are really small as compared to what goes on around the state. We look at, again at our infrastructure and how many schools we have. If, if a school is built to last about 50 years, uh, we'd need to replace about one a year. You all have heard this many times in the, in the past couple years. And there's our, also our, our expected life cycles of all our systems. And we base many of our infrastructure decisions on for systemic renovations and things uh, on those numbers and years, uh, depending on the condition of the actual equipment. So when you look at last year's facility master plan, we have two middle schools and an elementary school on the plan. We spaced them three years apart, uh, thinking this was in line with the uh, county's CIP. Sorry. <laughs> uh, at, at the life cycle would be 141 years if we did them every three years based on number of buildings, years between openings. Uh, but if you look at what is actually in the Washington County's draft capital improvement, They've increased that to four years between the projects, or a life cycle of 188. So this is really unsustainable with the number of buildings we have, and how are we going to replace them over the years with the number of schools that are going to be turning 50 uh, either now or in the next decade. Uh, so we all sat around and tried to figure out what can we do to have the greatest impact, knowing that we have these open schools which could have safety issues, that there's a intent with the Board of Ed to really focus on early childhood education, and also looking at uh, around the state at what other school systems are doing in terms of how big their schools are and, and, and how they build their facilities and maintain them. So we looked at elementary schools. These are our eight lowest ranked elementary schools in the system right now. Uh, Sharpsburg Elementary, you know, we're hopefully uh, going to bring to you uh, construction documents soon to be approved for bid, and then we'll bid it and start building it. So that's ready to go. Uh, the other schools, Hickory, Hancock, Greenbrier, Hold Forge, Fountain Rock, Potomac, and Fountaindale are the next lowest schools. So we focused on what can we do with those schools, and is, is there a solution? All those schools are very uh, uh, low and low capacity schools. So we started looking at a map, and, and this is the center of the county. Those are all the elementary school districts. The one in beige have a state rate of capacity greater than 400 seats. The ones in white all have uh, state capacity, uh, rate of capacities less than 400 seats. We said, what if we took Hickory and Fountain Rock and combined them? Now, when you look at these areas, I don't want you to think that that's what a future school boundary will look like because when we would go to redistrict for these kind of plans, uh, surely they will change. The, they'll be uh, affecting all the surrounding schools. Uh, but geographically, this is where those schools exist right now. We also looked at Old Forge and Greenbrier Elementary. Said maybe there's a, a possibility for some co consolidation, just like we did with Jonathan Hager when we looked at Conica Jig and Winter Street. And then finally, we said, what if we could do Potomac Heights and Fountaindale Elementary, two old schools, uh, one that's open, and combine those in, into one facility. He said, how can we do this for the least amount of dollars possible? There's been a lot of talk with the Knott Commission down at the state and other things about prototype school design. I know I've sat before you in the past and said prototype school designs sometimes don't save you the money that you think you will. They will if you can build them in rapid succession. If you spread the amount of time it takes between prototype schools. Programs change. Uh, contractors don't have the memory they would have if you build them in rapid succession. An architect's going to charge the same as he would if he was building three if it's spread over 10, 12 years. But if you can build them in rapid succession, 
you get the benefit you, of, of efficiency in both design and construction, and you should be able to save money, as well as you have a common educational specification for these schools, which meets what the school system is wanting to do right now. Again, with a prototype school, with the contractor familiarity and the refined design, also as you build one, you learn things. You should have less change orders on the follow-on school and on the follow-on school if you build them in rapid procession. Um, if you take more than 10 years to get these things done, you're also going to have changes in your ed spec, your technology is going to change, so, and, and your security, you don't know what's going to happen with that and where we're going to go. So. so Looking at those six schools, we see they have a combined capacity of 1,800 students, combined square footage of 244,073 acres. There's three of those schools that aren't on public water and sewer. We'd like to fix that. All three of those schools have well and, and septic. Uh, five of those six schools are open schools. But we can solve that problem with this plan. Also, a bonus is there's 12 portable classrooms located at schools. They would be eliminated. So we'd be lowering the, lowering the inventory of portable classrooms. How do we do it? We build three prototype schools, as we were talking about on those maps. New schools, uh, we would increase our capacity by 500 students, but our square footage only by 14,000, give or take. Uh, Normally, 500 students would take us about 60 to 65,000 square foot of new building to, to accommodate. So that's a bonus. We'd also lower the amount of acreage we have to take care of from 73 to 30 plus acres. Also, all schools would be on public water and sewer. They would not be open schools. They'd have all the latest security features and things in place and no portable classrooms. So if you take a look at the entire county, you can see again the schools that are greater than 400 seats versus the ones that are that are smaller. Our proposal, uh, well, we're solving one of those issues with the new Sharpsburg Elementary School, which will have 471 seats. That becomes one school, another school that's over 400. And if we follow through with this plan over time, you'll see the whole center of the county uh, is basically covered with schools uh, of a larger size. Um, the one in the middle is Emma K. Daub, and that might be something that we would tackle in the next 10-year plan as, as, as with an addition or something else. Then if you look at where development is in the county, right in the center of the county, as compared to where we're covering ourselves with these more efficient schools, you can see it matches up uh, very well with where development. We're putting the schools where the development's occurring uh, to handle future growth. Let's talk about money. This plan would reduce construction costs. If we had to renovate all six of those smaller schools, we believe it would cost around $158 million. They would require additions. Some would require gymnasiums and other things, probably increase the size uh, to match up with rounds and, and, uh, and enrollment projections. Um, all six of those schools will exceed 50 years in the next decade. Uh, it would be unlikely that we would be able to renovate all six in the next decade. Uh, it would be spread out over more time. So the construction of the three new buildings would cost $112 million. Still a lot, but $46 million less than if we were doing all seven. The key, though, is, is that the county's commitment to do six would be around $79 million. To do these three, it would be $48 million. It would be cost $38, $31 million less for our local government in terms of the money they need to put into the construction of these. Land needs, first school, we'd like to put it right outside this window. There's 16 acres sitting out there um, that we could use for an elementary school. We think that's a smart decision. It doesn't cost the county any money. It doesn't cost us any uh, further money. Uh, and uh, we end up with a school right here at Central Office where uh, real-time uh, incubator-type things can happen on the education side. So I think it's a, a good use of the land that we have. Uh, the second two, we're going to have to find properties. And we would look for schools, that, for properties that have available public utilities and the right topography to handle the prototype school that we would design for this site. We think that this plan would also reduce operational costs. Each new school saves about one and a quarter million dollars annually in general fund. 
by our estimate. Uh, it reduces the number, the acreage that we have to maintain. It reduces the number of buildings we have to maintain. Uh, the square footage remains almost identical to what we already have. Uh, and it reduces the number of support and administrative positions that we'd have to hire in the future. Things like uh, student resource officers, principals, nurses, food service, custodians. Um, we'd be able to uh, hopefully not have to hire as many in the future, saving operating costs. Uh, educational considerations, I think these are all important. Reduces portable classrooms, provides additional dedicated pre-kindergarten space. That's our push now. So instead of having two pre-K classrooms in a in a five-round school, we'd have four, right? And that basically takes care of, of, of what would be considered full-time pre-K for a five-round school, because not every parent has to put their kid in pre-K. Um, provides newer state-of-the-art facility, of course, to students sooner. If we were to do six schools in a row, it would take more time. If we do the three, more kids get better schools sooner. Right. Yeah, on the county's current plan, it would be 24 years before all those kids would get schools, new schools. Um, Full-time support staff. So staff members, certain programs that are half-time that have to travel between schools. When you have a larger school, they're set. They're there all the time. All the kids get that service all the time. Um, additional rounds better mitigate teacher-student ratios. If you have a, a, a one-and-a-half, two-round school, when, when you get a, a class size coming through, uh, the entire first grade is is 28 students, you have to make a decision, or 30 students, are you going to split it into two and have two 15-student uh, classes, or are you going to have one 28 or 30-student class? When you have a four or five-round school, you can divvy out those students over more classes, meaning there's not as much of a change between that when, you, when you're assigning teacher resources to schools. So it gives you some flexibility there. And of course, we generally put full-size gymnasiums and large play fields, which are great for the community to use after hours. So our plan would be to open three schools within four years or two years increments. And it takes a little time to get to the first one because we want to plan it right. But once we get it going, we'd want to crank them out as, as quickly as possible to, to make use of the savings you can get from building a prototype school, both in design and construction. Uh, this reduces the expected life cycle. It's a, just a good first step. Right now we have 47 buildings. If we did them every two years, it would still take 94 years. If we, do 40, if we have 44 buildings when we're done, it reduces it to 88 years. It's still not good enough, but it's a step in the right direction. Uh, capital funding, uh, it will require more money than the county is currently showing in their FY19 10-year plan to the tune of about $2, $2 million dollars above their current levels. I think right now their current level is $4 million a year for capital projects. We'd be asking for upwards of $6 million a year out of the county. It, it is an increase. It's a short-term increase. It's got the long-term benefits. In the end, they will be paying less for schools than they would uh, if, if we continued on the current path. Um, saves approximately $15 million over the cost of operating six renovated schools during the same 10-year period. And uh, once all schools are built, there would be about three and three quarter million dollars in operational savings every year just based on having the three schools instead of the six. Capital needs, as we spoke before, are reduced, 31 million overall savings in construction costs. Deferred maintenance is eliminated for six schools, so we don't have to go in and change the boilers, roofs on those schools. That all is eliminated. Uh, Short-term increase will net long-term overall savings. And we have reductions in future systemic renovation costs because the deferred maintenance is wiped out and these schools should be good for many years before we start, have to start replacing systems. At the state, has no impact on the FY20 request that, that we'll be making. Uh, that will still be the UIP and Sharpsburg increments. Uh, we, we would look, it would impact the, the 21 through 28. Uh, to the tune of about 8.2 to 10.9 million. We're going to spread the state payments out over four years instead of the usual three so that we can pull this off. Um, we know that the state's also considering changes to systemic project funding. We don't know if that's going to go away or not. That would be bad, but it would also allow us to always be able to be in the sweet spot of 8.2 to 10.9, which seems like is right around what the state uh, can afford every year. There's a lot of changes going on at the public school construction program. Uh, we don't know how that's all going to fall out. 
but we're trying to gear our plan toward what they've been doing in the past for now, and then we'll continue discussions with them until we uh, figure out exactly where they're going to land. Hopefully, there's a lot of talk about increasing the state funding for school construction from 300 to 400 million. If that comes through, there should be enough money for us. Uh, also, again, as I said earlier, the Knott Commission looked at uh, possible uses of prototype designs, and we will talk to the state and see if we can't be part of their model, and maybe we can receive assistance from the state in, in, the, in the design, and, and that maybe save us money, too, if we're a, a pilot program of some sort. So I'll give it back to Jeff. So clearly there are challenges and opportunities uh, with this plan, and we wanted to be uh, right up front with the board and talk about some of the things that, that we've hashed around as we look at this. Uh, there's already been some, uh, some media coverage of this plan as we vetted this plan through the Facilities Committee. Uh, and some of the initial outreach concerning this plan was that the communities are def definitely very familiar with their current schools. Uh, and the thought process of my neighborhood school might be going away, and that, that is a concern. Uh, you know, for the community to address. The one thing that is important, I think, to note is that um, a student in kindergarten today would, would not likely be in one of these schools when it opens. We're five years out. Uh, it should be moved forward today or with, with approval in June. We are at least five years out from the opening of the first school. So a student in kindergarten today would be in, on to middle school by the time that, that school opens. Uh, but we do believe uh, on the opportunity side to combat uh, the concern about the community familiar, familiarity, uh, that this is a fiscally responsible plan based on funding realities, both on the construction side and on the operating side moving forward, both for, um, you know, where we are, uh, where we're moving forward, where our struggles are in the operation side budget, but also where uh, we're trying to be cognizant of where the county is in terms of their capital needs as well. Uh, and, and again, three of the less facilities to maintain in the future that have systemic needs that are, that are coming up on our list that we, that we need to address. Um, future redistricting would be required. There's, you know, we're not going to parse words on this one. Um, you know, we know that this would require a, re a redistricting uh, at the elementary level. Uh, but it provides more elementary students with newer facilities uh, and additional pre-kindergarten space sooner. You know, as, as Chad mentioned, uh, and Rob as well, that you know, if we were to prioritize these six schools to the county today under the current county plan, the last school opens 24 years from today, roughly, uh, whereas we're hoping to have those students in those new schools in 10 years, and we think that's a bonus for our students uh, to be in, in safer, newer facilities that can provide more educational opportunities to them. We understand it's an increase in the local CIP. Um, and again, we, we've had regular conversations with county staff. We understand where they are. Uh, but it does not impact FY20 uh, CIP. Uh, and the board can also provide an alternate plan in 2019. We can come back here to this table a year from now and decide in consultation with the county and with county government where they are um, that that funding is not there. And we decide, all right, it's not going to work. Let's come back and let's, let's, we'll drum up another plan for you in 12 months. Uh, but we think it's a good first step in at least laying out some opportunities that are available. There are unpredictable factors as well, um, and we, we realize that this provides flexibility. We don't know where enrollment's going to be. While we, we plan and we think we're pretty close to the vest, and we match up with Maryland Department of Planning and, and with um, um, public pathways in terms of our, our, our enrollment projections, who knows? You know, if you, if you have seen some of the recent reports on, on housing starts and housing values, there is, a, there is an uptick um, to our east. You know, housing values are continuing to climb. Um, you know, does, does housing get shut off to our east and folks have to come west and we need capacity? This plan provides capacity. Um, it also potentially provides, and I think, you know, Rob showed it on the screen but maybe didn't talk about it a lot, but within the prototype, we could look at, three-round, four-round, five-round schools that have planned expansions like Jonathan Hager. So we wouldn't necessarily have to build them all to the full additional 500 capacity initially. We could start them smaller but have those planned growth spaces identified that we could come back to and build in the same way we did Jonathan Hager. So we can build this with, with additional flexibilities. Um, lastly, you know, we do have to talk about our systemic renovations, capital improvement on the maintenance side uh, through the EFMP. These are some of the highlights uh, that are our planned renovations uh, that need to be made to our systemic systems moving forward. Uh, the two, two on the top, you know, they were in our FY19 capital improvement plan. 
Uh, to this point, we have not seen funding at the state level for these projects. Um, we plan to resubmit these for FY20 funding at this point unless something miraculous happens uh, with funding in, in the near term. Um, but you, you see some others up here, North Hagerstown High School Chiller Replacement, Smithsburg High School HVAC is a major replacement. Uh, that replacement could run upwards of $6 million. Uh, and I also want to highlight for you down in the, in towards the bottom, Williamsport High School HVAC replacement is also another one in the, in the uh, sort of the out years that is a major replacement that was in the CIP that could be as high as $10 million. Um, so we've got some major replacements that we have to come. You know, we are sort of shifting gears. You know, in, the, in, our, in our latest plan, we're shifting back into, into elementary. And we have aging middle schools that had been at the forefront of our plan. Western Heights was the next school up, Springfield behind it. Uh, we are sort of putting that one down the road a little bit. Um, we have to address that. You, you, we know it. You know it. Um, um, we have to continue to have conversations with county staff and, and county commissioners um, on our needs for infrastructure. I think they heard that loud and clear in terms of overall county infrastructure at the hearing last week. We want to continue those conversations, but we wanted to put a plan in front of you that we think is fiscally responsible and, and can be uh, a benefit to the community in the long term. And with that, we're happy to accept any questions that you have on the plan. Welcome, Dr. Michael. Good afternoon. <coughs> Wet trip back from Baltimore. <laughs> Jeff, um, looking at these, didn't we just do, how long ago did we do South's route? South is in parts, and I'll defer to the team. How Three much figures. of it have we got? We, uh, we did it a little over half of the roof um, with the first phase, and our intent was to go back this year for the second phase because it was the first year it was eligible, yeah. and that was based on the renovation projects that happened in, I think it was 99 and 2000, uh, or 2001. Yeah. yeah. That long ago? Yes, sir. It's not that long ago. I, I graduated in 98, <laughs> so it <laughs> oh, But thank you for that. It seems like <laughs> And I think, the, I think the key to, while it is just becoming eligible, the key there is also to um, get that done in a close enough fashion to the most recent renovation to that roof so that when we get to the next time, we can submit the whole roof at one time and do it as one project as opposed to split pairs. Well, that was almost a necessity to do it when we did it, wasn't it? We were having some issues with that part of the roof. Yes, sir. We, we still are. We, ha we have some portions of that roof because that the state considered that as a total renovation. There's probably some kid, 10 year old roof that, that, that didn't get replaced. Finished in 2001, it was probably 10 years old at that point. So it actually wanted to repair it. Okay. And, and again, I think all that's part of our effort to always maximize state dollars. We could have replaced the, the South High roof that needed to be replaced several years ago, but we would have had to do it on the local dime. I remembered. I remember yep, that. You're remembering well, correctly. Oh my God, it's been. <coughs> to, to be honest, it was actually kind of worked out pretty good because to do the whole roof in the summer might have been a little taxing. Um, doing it in half, it, it yeah. allowed us to get. The roof, yes. Yes, sir. But they were spaced based on the availability, availability of state funding to pay for right. the roof. Right. And all these, I mean, what's kind of the timeline we'd like to do all these? I mean, some significant stuff. I mean, I thought, again, HVAC at Smithsburg, I thought we had just done some, maybe it was chiller or something, I don't know what. Six point seven million dollars or something, that what the estimate That's is. Where you get boilers. Boilers, um, okay. You know, oh, okay. Cool, you know, get warm, but it's not, not cool. I got you. Well, that, that would be the air side of it. Actually, right. Like the, the air distribution side for the whole school. It's an original unit to the 65 building. These aren't all projects that need to be done in Fiscal year, fiscal no, I understand, year. but I'm just yep. looking at that as a, I mean, that's a significant amount of work. The other part, <clears throat> I mean, I'll probably will have a lot of people writing me emails again. These are not bad ideas. I mean, any time that we can get away from well and septic, I'm a happy camper. You know, it's that, that, that is a nightmare waiting to happen. So if any time we could hook up to public water and sewer, I would be a happy person. Um, we built three schools in how many years was it, Rob? Uh, they all opened in the same year. Same year. August so 2008, they opened. What was what year? Bangor, Morgansville, Morgansville and Rockland Woods. Woods. So we can do that. I mean, it's not, and the county has funded it. It's not, 
it's not right. out it's not outrageous to make that type of request or not outrageous to have that kind of idea um, and we we opened up a great deal of space you know in all areas now Rockland you know we heard for you know, we had the, the crash of the housing market and all of a sudden Westfields wasn't growing they're building they're building uh, and the same thing out at where Jonathan Hager is they're still building <laughs> Addition to Jonathan Hager out there in the, in the out years, yeah, uh, and, and that might have to close uh, out of these other projects depending on what yeah. happens with development. Yeah, yeah. So these are not bad ideas. I mean, yeah. I, I, trying to figure out <coughs> for for uh, I mean Fountaindale. I think Fountaindale and and Potomac Heights. I don't know if we could use one of the sites. To build the yeah, other school, a on that. right? There might be some opportunities that, that uh, would surface that we, when we start looking. At right. The other one, Old Forge and Greenbower, even that, as you look at it on the map, that that makes sense. But I'm trying to see where, where is their water and sewer right. in that, in that land mass, and I don't see it. Yep. <laughs> that one might require an extension. So yeah. It would, it would add, add some cost. look at where those resources are now and try to minimize the impact of what an extension could be. Oh, the other thing, if I don't, excuse me, the other thing, the, um, I mean, our last two, or last, the last redistricting we did was probably the easiest one in the year, you know, the 14 years I've been here. You know, the, uh, the fact that we now can pinpoint where people are and where kids are, it makes perfect sense to, you know, it, it, it makes it a lot easier. There's not going to be the turmoil uh, that we had in some of our earlier redistricting right. efforts. So, uh, I mean, I like this because I really do believe that this is, we have to do something like this. It, it, it makes perfect sense and it can be done. We've done it. I mean, we've built three schools in three years. Good job. Interesting. I um, like the plan very much, and I'm, I guess the other member that was here when we built those three schools at one time. Um, a couple of other thoughts occurred to me or might be slight challenges or whatever. What kind of reaction are the commissioners going to have to possibly having six empty schools in their hands? with an answer before we I think redistricting could actually affect middle and high school lower elementary because of the way we work our feeder program you don't want to put the cart before the horse but absolutely if the plan was okay challenge, uh, we would thing to do that. start raising money And my thought is, looking this far out, we have no idea, you know, what will happen in those terms, water and sewer, by the time we're ready to start thinking about purchasing land and start building. So it could. Right, right. I like the idea. I think um, I like the idea of using the land that we have here. I think in terms of the old, um, and this goes back hundreds of years, the laboratory schools. Um, I think the potential there is great. Good things could happen for kids there. Um, so I, I think 
if we start talking with the commissioners early on and let them know that we're looking to the future, that they could certainly be thinking in terms of what this is going to mean for them and their capital plan, their capital budget. So I think uh, I like it. I like it a lot. President Mrs. Wayne, I'm sorry. I, I, just, I just had a question. I'm sorry. What, what's a laboratory school? A laboratory school? I think of Shepherd College. They had a laboratory school there, an elementary school on, on campus, Got and they it, used okay. that kind of to Shippensburg. train their teachers and yeah, Shippensburg. Okay. train okay. their teachers and a lot of, uh, I don't want to use the word experiments, but that kind of goes along with the idea of a lab. Uh, I think a lot of innovative ideas um, were able to come yeah. out of that situation. And I think at West Virginia University, <clears throat> I think they still have it. They did a few years ago. They had a university high school, which I always thought was a laboratory school up there, but I was never sure of that. But that was the name of it, University High School out of, wow, okay. out of Morgantown. Uh, I ditto everything that uh, uh, Wayne and Jackie have said. I like the plan. Um, I would have never thought it makes sense. Uh, Greenbrier, Old Forge, come up 40, cross 66, yeah. I, but I just never thought of them being contiguous like that. But I have a question. We're talking about replacing 50-year-old schools, but most of our high schools are, well, South was probably open in 56, and then North 57, 58. Of course, they've been remodeled and everything. I realize that. Uh, I don't know when Boone's Bar, the new high school, was open. I have no idea on that. Oh, really? Yep. I thought it was older than that, to be honest with you. I looked through it. Okay. Okay. No, I thought it was older than that. Uh, but um, most of the schools are approaching between 40 and 50 years old. Obviously, we're not going to replace those high schools thinking about replacing them when they get to the 50-year mark. So why do we do it for the elementary schools? I mean, I, I'm just asking a question because Williamsport's going to be 2020, be 50 years old, and that school is to the person looking at that, the citizen out there, that school's in excellent shape. Of course, it's been partially remodeled in certain places. So we're looking at the elementary schools right now because we're trying to find the, the biggest bang for the buck. What, what, Im, where can we have the greatest impact for the least amount of money? Uh, the open, the openness of those elementary schools, things like that. We just think that that's the smart approach to go right now. But yes, those high schools will have to be maybe not replaced, but modernized, like South and North were. Yeah, coming into the next uh, 20 years and 30 years, there's absolutely going to have to be something done for those those schools. And it, it, there's six schools, high schools that were built in the in the 70s or before. There's six middle schools uh, in the inventory that are that old. Um, so yeah, it, it's daunting. That all that stuff uh, will have to be done. Here we can take six of those 19 of, of those 24 schools that are that old in one fell swoop and, and, and do something in a short period of time. So we thought uh, this was a good start to that effort. But the next 10 years are going to be just as uh, daunting, I think, in terms of trying to figure out what to do with our facilities. It, it's an issue. Getting your, crystal, getting your crystal ball, is there a chance? Some of us may never see it, but is there a chance that some of these buildings, like the high school buildings, could be still being used 30, 40 years from now? If you invest the money in modernizing them, then the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, when you get into uh, doing feasibility studies on those kind of projects, one of the things you look at is, is it, is it uh, more cost effective to renovate what you have or to just start over and, and build something new? And sometimes building new is less expensive than renova renovating what you have. Um, but that's down the road. And that's why we do the feasibility studies and work hard with the architects and engineers to figure out what the best approach is, and then that's what we bring to you folks at, at, at that time. Mr. Rollins, for my colleagues, and I, I've had the experience of being in school, so I know the concept of rounds, right. but in terms of a five-round school, could you give us some examples of what those schools are so that my colleagues would know about the size of schools we're talking about? Right, so a round is, is a five-round school would have five first grade, five second grade, five third grade, and so forth, kindergarten. And, and so forth. Uh, a school of that size right now would be uh, Morgansville, Pangborn, Rockland Woods, Salem Avenue. They added the fifth round during uh, construction. That's correct. So that size school. That size school. Mm -hmm. Bester's a four. Bester's a four. Johnson is a four. 
Jonathan Hager. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Good chair. Thank you. What worries me is the funding from the local system for this from the county commissioners. I mean, <laughs> they've done it before, but right now we're having trouble getting our operating budget. They gave us what two hundred thirty thousand more. Um, not counting the maintenance of effort that they had to do because of low effort and so forth. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how they're going to react. I agree. That's why the key to this, as we, as we put it together, was you're going to save operating money. Um, you're, you're going to save in construction dollars over time. So we tried to find ways to make it attractive uh, to the county also in terms of their outlays over time. Uh, it is a little bit of short-term pain, though. There's no, there's no getting around it in terms of asking for a little bit more money right now, uh, but it saves in the long term. There's also the obvious fact that there's an election coming up. Well, <clears throat> the other thing I think to delay some type of plan, that was part of the challenge, you know, I directed staff, we've got to come up with something else. We can't keep all acting like we're going to have this 180 plus year replacement cycle and that's okay and just keep coming year after year after year and not deal with that. So I, I applaud the efforts of staff. They put together, I think, a pretty creative plan. Uh, again, I'm sure they went through the details of how we eliminate five open schools and some of the, the main issues we have with some of those schools. But the other challenge is to fail to act on this and or some other plan just continues to build the crisis. You know, the, the further off we put the next modernization, the next rebuild of a school, um, it, that 180 plus year number is going to grow even higher uh, to fail to act. So this just addresses a small number of schools, but it does at least get us started in the right direction. So I guess it's away from those, like you say, five to six open schools right. and 12 portables. I mean, that alone, that alone is, you know. I mean, isn't that something? It is. It really is. It, and and that, isn't that something that the county commissioners on the our security task force, isn't that something that they're looking at as mm -hmm. well? That's one of the things we're worried about. This is one of the ways that we can take care of that. That's correct. If we ever looked at security resource officers everywhere, it would reduce the number needed by three. So right. that would be an ongoing operational cost okay. too. So we're we're trying to be trying to be creative. Y yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Principal, head secretary, head custodian. Lo lots of staffing. Plus, the benefit to the students. Um, when we opened Jonathan Hager, I remember the Conoco Jig students coming over and the staff, and they now had full-time staff members where they had half or quarter time before, so those students got those teachers more often because it was a little bigger school, and, and I, I think that's a benefit to some of these facilities as well. And it's exciting for students and staff when they come from an older school to that brand new school. I mean, I can remember, um, substituting when I was on the substitute at Jonathan Hager and being amazed at all the great things that they had and the kids were really enthusiastic about it so and staff Balfour you had something you wanted to say well I was going to say something there's one thing on this last sheet that intrigued me but I think it's just best I keep quiet <laughs> well, I respect I'll tell you later <laughs> privately I respect that I can only imagine one thing that we actually didn't give you a number, and that's the deferred maintenance that we currently report for those schools. Uh -huh. for it's those five. It's five point two million dollars in deferred maintenance for those six schools right now, and there's two million. Mm -hmm. And that that would have to be spent through painting, carpeting, you know, some of the the larger systemics, but some of the smaller things that add up to make a, a school habitable and, and and appealing to students. I uh, just want to go on record saying I'm very much in support of this plan. Um, I liked it when you brought it to the facilities committee. I like it today. Uh, it's great to hear numbers like $46 million in savings for us, $39 million in savings for the county. I would hope that has some bearing as they make decisions to fund us more sooner than they would normally would. 
um, and just the economies of scale, as everybody's been talking about, of, of having the, the three as opposed to the six. Um, the one thing that gives me heartburn that's been brought up is what do we do with the, the old buildings? I still see old buildings sitting there, and it just would be um, great to have some kind of plan for them. I know we're, we're thinking that. Um, do any of the sites, are they large enough now to handle this kind of a prototype that are currently there? We're not ready to say. Uh, possibly, but they might not be in the, in the exact location. For instance, the, the uh, ones that don't have water and sewer. Mm, that's yeah. the ones you'd want to consider. Um, uh, also, it is the, even though we've done it, it's, it's better if we could build a school off-site. It's an inconvenience to the students and staff uh, that if we can avoid it, uh, we'd rather build on a somewhere else. On somewhere else. But okay. uh, uh, we won't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We'll keep them in mind in case there's a possibility there. Okay. Um, I think, and I think all my other questions were answered. So thank you. I want to go on record as saying, and I think it's a great plan, also. And um, haven't they sold the two schools? The county has sold them, so they're not empty. Okay. Yeah. So they they have been sold. A possibility that the other schools will find True, new yeah. owners. Yep. Or open to the rec center they want to build. It's possible. Yeah. I mean, there, yeah, there's definitely ideas. Yeah. Well, you think I just think of like the old Washington Street School that's just still just think in terms of sitting there being an eyesore. It's like. And its closeness to the Valley Mall. Um, you know, there's. There's recreation opportunities in the. Maybe the buildings themselves, but also just the parcels themselves. I mean, we yeah. use uh, lands for uh, playing soccer teams. fields, soccer something like that. <coughs> Turn them into parks, community areas. Joint site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, no further questions. I think, Mrs. Williams, if yes, you know the board is in favor, this is an item we can duly note notes of ours today and some of your comments, and we're happy to bring the item forward to you on June 5th to seek your approval. Is that the consensus of the board? All right. We can have the large book put together. <coughs> and the so no picnics on Memorial Day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.